The Conquer Worry Show, episode number 17. Welcome to the Conquer Worry Show, the show dedicated to helping people who are struggling with their mind. If you are looking for stories of resilience, if you are looking for motivation or inspiration, or if you are just looking for strategies to conquer worry, this is the show for you. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Conquer Worry Show. I am your host, Jay Coulter, and this show is focused on bipolar disorder. And I have a special guest with me today, Mr. Andy Berman. Now, Andy is someone who struggles with bipolar. He is the author of a book called Electro Boy, a memoir of mania. And please listen to episode seven of the Conquer Worry Show to hear his amazing story. It is our most downloaded episode to date. And today, Andy works as a consultant helping people who struggle with mental illness. Andy, are you ready to help some folks conquer worry? Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Jay, for having me on. Yeah, I appreciate you coming back on again. Now, we would like to get to know you, and we're interested in learning some things before we get started that we couldn't find in a simple Google search. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I mean, you want me to tell you something that you may not be able to find, and I think one of the most important things that's not really written about is that uh, I, you know, I, I'm not a patient with bipolar disorder who has recovered. I live with bipolar disorder every day. I always tend to say I cope and manage with it, but I know that bipolar disorder, an episode you know, always lurks around the corner. So I may be good at living with it, but I'm not recovered. Yeah, that, that's very fair. In fact, listeners, if you do a Google search of Andy, you'll find a lot of information, some presentations that he's given. And you're right, Andy, none of them actually speak to the fact that this is something that you manage. Now, we... it's, well, it's not something that I, it's, nothing points to the fact that this is something that going to be cured for me. And uh, I've, been, I've been living with it, you know, since I was a kid. And I'm not a kid anymore. I've got my own kids. But uh, I think I've got some really good tools uh, to teach people how to manage living with it. Excellent. Excellent. Now, Andy, our listeners know we like to bookend our interviews with the most important questions. And we'll talk about finding your life's purpose later. But let's focus on worry right now. In just one to two sentences, how do you personally conquer worry? Wow. Uh, I mean, worry for me is uh, waking up and saying, oh, my God, how am I going to face this day? Uh, I don't know how great I'm feeling right now. I've got so much to do. And, you know, this, this, this may sound very abstract, uh, but, you know, I could look out the window and say, wow, look at the grass. The grass doesn't look so bad. It looks pretty green. Uh, it's not going to be a terrible day. You know, I really do this quick psych up. Uh, you know, I, I kind of psych myself up for the day. And I, I just say, you know what? You know, I think I even said to someone today, you know, it was FDR who said, you know, all we have to fear is fear itself. For me, I think more about worry than fear. Yeah, I fear certain stuff, but I worry way too much. And when I drop the worry, I actually have time to, you know, to get things done and to live. So you're proactive with it first thing in the morning. Yeah, yeah, and not in a weird way. I mean, I'm just like, come on, you know, don't worry about it. You're going to get it done. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Now, everybody has struggled with some form of worry at some time in their life, and maybe it was a severe mental illness or maybe something less harsh like a particularly stressful period in time. Andy, take us to a low point in your life and tell us— Well, there are about 19 <laughs> low points, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you one. Uh, you know, I uh, was involved— when I was extremely manic in an art counterfeiting scandal in New York, and this was in the early 90s. I was really young. I was still in my 20s. And um, 
you know, I did, it, it, it was my first moment of like really freezing. You know, here I was counterfeiting artwork, shipping it overseas, and I got caught by the feds. And the next thing I knew was that the U.S. government was after me, and they wanted to make an example of an art counterfeiter. Um, and I just thought, oh, my God, like I'm going to go to trial, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen to me. Uh, and it was really frightening and it was all about fear and it was all about worry. Um, and how did I get through it? I mean, I, I let someone else guide me through it. I let my psychiatrist guide me through it. I let a lawyer guide me through it. I had a lot of trust. Uh, and I figured, you know, if I don't get, you know, an A or an A minus and I end up with a B or a B plus, you know, that's the best I'm going to do in this battle against worry. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I ended up with about a B plus. Yeah, I did go to prison, and uh, that caused a whole other series of worry, but I, uh, I dealt with it. Okay. Well, let's switch gears and talk about bipolar disorder. Yes. Can you describe it to somebody who doesn't have any experience with the disease? Yeah, I mean, bipolar disorder, you know, for me, um, it's a roller coaster ride. It's, uh, you know, just like a roller coaster, roller coaster has, you know, really, you know, uh, big highs and big lows and dips. And, you know, there's tremendous excitement when you're all the way up there. But when you're coming down, there's this panic. Sometimes I say it's like walking a tightrope, bipolar disorder, and there's no net underneath you. So you're not really taking into consideration the consequences of your actions, which, you know, in my case, in retrospect, I mean, we're really without much worry, meaning I wasn't thinking about, you know, really how dangerous so many of the things I was doing was. And I'm not just talking about counterfeiting artwork. I'm talking about addictions. I'm talking about drugs, alcohol. I'm talking about sex. I'm talking about poor financial decisions. And these are all things which are symptomatic of bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. And so do you know when you're going through the manic phase that you're in a manic phase? Are you able to identify that's where you are? Uh, uh, Back then, no. I don't think I had the skills. I mean, I think uh, I could go through um, long stretches of manic episodes that could last, you know, you know, up to two and three months. And I thought I was just... I just thought I was high functioning and successful and productive. I didn't realize what I was doing was dangerous. Uh, I didn't realize I was breaking the law. I didn't realize I was, you know, I was really putting myself in a situation where eventually I'd I'd have to pay the price. But no, I didn't realize it then. Uh, Today I do. That's the difference. Well, then based on that experience, how could a parent or friend – identify someone that is showing the signs of bipolar? Well, I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're the classic symptoms, uh, you know, and they're, you know, I, 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 they're not cliche. They're just classic. Um, but, you know, people show them in different ways. For example, there's, uh, you know, a lot of bipolar people don't sleep. They can stay up, you know, 48 hours. Uh, and, you know, we all have parallels in our symptoms. I mean, a 65-year-old woman with bipolar has a lot of the same symptoms as a 27-year-old boy, man. Uh, so it could be overspending, uh, racking up lots of debt, uh, borrowing lots of money. It could be... Uh, it, you know, it could be excessive consumption, drugs, alcohol, uh, sexual promiscuity. It could be, you know, just racing thoughts, just the inability to just kind of sit down and just kind of focus because, you know, there's just all this stuff going through your head at once. Like, ah, I want to, you know, in my case, you know, I want to be an art dealer. I want to be a gossip columnist. I want to work for NASA. I want to r- run for U.S. Senate. Uh, so, you know, you see people making you know, just constantly running. I mean, for me, physically, I was running too. I was traveling. You know, I would get on a plane at JFK and go to Tokyo. When I go to Tokyo, I'd, you know, fly back to Paris. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. And they were just random choices. Those would obviously... So that's what you'll see. Yeah, that would be easy to identify, I could see. So going back to the parent trying to identify it in a child... Obviously, I don't think a child's going to go get on a plane and fly around the world like you did in, in 24 no, hours. But, like, what signs could they look for? But an 18-year-old child might. 
uh, and when I talk to people whose kids have bipolar, I mean, we're talking about, you know, sometimes, yes, we're talking about 15-year-olds sometimes, but for the most part, for some odd reason, we're talking about, you know, 15, uh, we're talking about, you know, kids who are between the ages of, you know, 22 and 30 who are really, um, really messing up. And yes, if their parents looked back, they would see that they had missed a couple of things when these kids were, you know, 14, 15, 16. Gotcha. Some early warning signs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you were able to identify those early warning signs, or even not, they're starting to act out, what, what's the best way to approach somebody? Well, I mean, you know, are you saying if that person is, is, uh, to get is younger? Younger or older, maybe somebody 15, 25. Actually, Andy, I guess it doesn't really matter. If someone you love is struggling, you think it might be bipolar, what's the best way to yeah, approach Yeah, I mean, them? one of the most difficult things is bringing up the issue. I mean, I talk to parents all the time who say, you know, Andy, like the hardest thing, I've got to tell my kid I'm watching this behavior. He's not sleeping. He's not eating. He's... Uh, He's definitely involved in uh, in using drugs. He's uh, he's spending money. He's actually stealing money from us. But the parents always say the same thing. I don't want to say anything because I don't really want to upset I'm, I'm using the uh, pronoun of he or him. I don't want to upset him. I don't want him to be angry. I don't want him to run. Like, I, I feel like he's safe here. When, in fact, you know, so much can really happen you know, in a parent's house that, you know, at some point they can't put up with it anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, my answer is, well, you know, it seems like what you want to do is avoid it and just, you know, quick, you know, just come out and say, you know, we've been noticing X, Y, and Z, and you need to see a psychiatrist. Well, that's not often met with much enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. So it's this very, very, very gentle way of explaining you know, to a, quote, kid, whether that kid is 15 or whether that kid is 35, uh, you know, I'm kind of worried. And, you know, I always say, you know, let them ask questions. What are you worried about? And, you know, then you just start saying, you know, I've seen, you know, X, Y, and Z. I've seen you doing this. I've seen you doing that. And how do you feel? Are you okay? You know, you have to understand, I'm, I'm a professional patient. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a psychiatrist. Uh, but, you know, I've probably talked to more than probably nine or 10,000 patients or, and corresponded with almost twice as many. So, you know, I've seen so many different variants of this and how families deal with it. And uh, a lot of families make the same mistake, which is, you know, they generally scare their kid away okay. before they can get help. Uh, and that never has a pretty ending. So being on the other side of the table, the resistance that the parent or loved one could expect to get is immediate pushback? Yes. I mean, there's so many, you know, but on the other hand, there's so many, there's so many parents who go in the other direction, which is to like, you know, it's almost like, which is, you know, to like coddle or baby their kid and and just say, well, you know, we're going to take care of this, this, and this, as long as, you know, you behave. And they have to understand that, their kid is not behaving. Their kid is a kid with an illness. So it's not something their kid can control. That's, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes. Yeah, in fact, trying to incentivize getting well by saying, you know, make sure you behave. Gotcha, gotcha. And I've that never le- said that before, but that's a problem. Yeah. That, that leads into my next question. And I tell you, in our first interview, you made a statement that really kind of stuck with me. And You said that you don't conquer or overcome bipolar. You learn how to manage it. And that really kind of holds true to most mental illnesses. And that's been part of my struggle with depression. You don't get over it. You learn how to manage it. Andy, how are you managing your bipolar today? Um, Well, my first answer would be pretty well. (laughs) And (laughs) my second answer would be just by, like, constantly checking with myself. For example, when I'm sitting around, I'm thinking or... In front of the computer, and I'm like, wait, Andy, you've been in front of the computer for like nine hours. What are you doing? You know, like, what are you doing? <laughs> I mean, you're like, what you set out to do was like a 20 minute task, and now you've like moved into something that looks more like an addiction. You know, you're 
you're checking out social media, you're Googling X, Y, and Z, you know, and, uh, or you're, you know, you're shopping online a little bit excessively, you're not thinking about it, and you're doing it, just, I mean, so for great, you know, great lengths of time, and then I'm able to say, oh, God, you know, I can shut this off, and shutting it off is going to be kind of sad, uh, but I gotta like just eat something, and I've got to go to sleep because it's four in the morning right now. So you know that happens to me once or twice a month. Sometimes it happens three times a month, um, but at least I'm able to recognize it. Would you say then that falls under the camp of self awareness, paying attention? Yeah, paying attention and uh, realizing that you know there are other things that you're avoiding that are really critical to pay attention to. And they're just kind of slipping away. Mm -hmm. And those are going to create greater problems down the road. Have you taken a different approach in the past to managing the bipolar? Uh, A different approach than that? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, a a different approach. It's called ignoring. (laughs) (laughs) You know, that was my way of managing. Oh, no, it's okay. You know, it's, it's not a problem at all. And, you know, I'll take on, you know, 10 or 12 jobs. Uh, I mean, even my mom says to me today, you know, when she checks in, she's like, I don't know how you multitask. I mean, you know, I don't know how you're doing way too many things. And, you know, if she, you know, she's, she's a pretty good gauge of, you know, of what goes on in my life because we have so much contact. So if there's a family member or a friend who you have that much contact with, you know, when you're in my situation, sometimes they have like no fear of all, no fear at all of saying, "You got us. What's going on? Or like, what are you doing? Or where are you going? Or how come I can't find you? Or why aren't you picking up the phone?" So, and then you know, because you've been through it so many times, you don't want to play that game. Oh, don't worry about me. I'm fine. You know, generally my response is, "Oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing." Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I am exhausted, and I don't know what I'm doing. So. Well, Andy, I read that in the past you had looked at or had gone through ECT, and for I somebody did, listen- which we call electroshock, but I mean, if we call I call it ECT too. Yeah, I did. Okay, so for our listeners who don't know what that is, could you put, give a little history to it? Talk a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, about electroshock has been used for a, a long time. I mean, um, electroshock today is a lot different than it was in the fifties and sixties when. You know, Jack Nicholson was having ECT in uh, One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, ECT was used for me because I had been unsuccessful with more than 45 medications to control my mania. And my doctor said to me, I'm not a big fan of ECT. I don't think, I think you're going to be really too sensitive, but if you want to give it a shot, give it a shot. I was so manic at that point, I was excited about ECT. I was like, oh, yeah, great, exciting. Uh, You know, Ernest Hemingway did this. Francis Farmer did this. But on the other hand, and I may have told you this in the last interview, but I think it's important to repeat. I was so, I was, I was so manic. I just kept thinking, not only will this be fun, but then I also, I kind of was like, you know, I can't control this illness. Medication isn't working. The combination of medication and therapy isn't working. And at least if I have ECT, I can tell every single person. Well, guess what? I've tried. You know the most, you know, extreme treatment for my illness. And if it doesn't work, they can't blame me anymore. Um, On the other hand, you know, people say to me, God, you know, ECT, it's terrible. I don't know how you can condone that. Well, first of all, A, I would never do it again. B, uh, just because of the side effects and how much time I lost and how much memory I lost. But the other thing is, you know, it's a personal choice. I mean, I do think it saved my life, uh, but, boy, it also set me back. So I'm not pro. I'm not anti. I'm just saying it's a personal choice. Gotcha. Fair enough. Fair enough. So And not, and not painful at all. I, I mean, I, I do have to say that I'm more scared to go to a than I remember, you know, than having ECT. I mean, because you're totally out. But it is a scary thing to have ECT when doctors can't even really – Come up, they can't agree on why it works. Gotcha. So, that's scary. Well, Andy, you're a wealth of information for anybody struggling with bipolar. Tell our listeners how they could find you, your services, and maybe find a copy of your book. 
Yeah, I mean, first of all, I don't know how I became such a wealth of information because I'm really just patient. Yeah, I did write a book called Electro Boy, and, uh, you know, and somehow I got this, well, I, I, the title of the book is Electro Boy, so I got the name in Electro Boy, but I also got this kind of title of Bipolar Poster Boy. Um, but, hey, if it helps one person, great. Uh, my book, which is published by Random House, uh, can be found on uh, Amazon for the most part or online. Uh, it won't be published again in paperback until uh, a film version is made. But uh, there are always copies out there, and people can contact me, um, you know, on Twitter at uh, Electro Boy USA. Um, that's an easy way. Uh, or just write to me if you've got a question or an issue about your worry about your mental illness. It doesn't have to be bipolar disorder. I mean, I certainly have suffered with depression and anxiety, and I can be contacted easily at electroboy at electroboy.com. And we'll have all that information in the show notes for this episode. And so, Andy, to move on to the final questions, you know, we're convinced at Conquer Worry that finding your life's purpose really lays the foundation for conquering anything that you're struggling with. And I've also found that most people can't articulate what their purpose is. In no more than three sentences, could you tell us what your life purpose is, Andy? Uh, yeah. Um, wow. Um, I was prepared for this, but, you know, when you ask the question, my right. life's purpose is to uh, – has changed quite a bit. I mean, I'm a dad. I've got two daughters who are seven and nine. Uh, I want them to uh, – grow up in a world where, uh, you know, they realize that whatever issues come up in their life, whether it's bipolar, depression, anxiety, uh, you know, fear, worry, uh, whatever kind of disorder or illness, um, that, you know, it's no different than having, you know, uh, diabetes um, or, you know, any other physical disease. Um, yeah, it's a brain disorder. I don't like calling my bipolar disorder a brain disorder. I mean, I, I like to call it, a, you know, a mental illness. It's just what I like to do. But I guess somehow I was uh, – someone passed the baton on to me and said, uh, go out there and say it's okay. Go out there and say – I even go as far as saying, you know, it's a, it's a blessing and it's a curse. Mm -hmm. So – that's one, <laughs> and that's right. definitely more than three sentences. Well, you've clearly done a lot of work in the space trying to break down some of the stigma that comes with bipolar, and that's how you and I actually connected. Uh, yeah. Now, the final question here, how would you recommend somebody go out and find their life's purpose? I don't think you go out and find it. I, I, I think I, – I, I somehow think it kind of comes to you. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, here I was in New York. I mean – you know, male stripper, hustler, gossip columnist, public relations uh, agent. Uh, I didn't know. I mean, I was just, I was searching, searching, searching. And guess what? I never found it. It found me um, rather organically. Uh, you know, I got into a lot of trouble. I got very ill. And for almost a decade, I suffered. Uh, and it took a big comeback. And then I realized that I had a story to tell about bipolar disorder. Um, I had never really read a truly honest account of anyone suffering with bipolar. Depression, yes, not bipolar. And I had never read an account at all by a male with bipolar disorder. And I just kind of said, mm, God, I'd like to share the story, but only if I can tell it honestly, and that meant sharing every detail. And some of those details are gory. Some of those, pe some people read my book and they say, "Ah, I don't want to know all that." Well, if you don't want to know all that, then you don't truly want to understand the illness, and you don't want to understand mental illness. And mental illness is not pretty. I mean, it would be it would be nice to say, you know, it's it's an awesome to have mental illness. It's awesome to be on meds, all of it. But it's not it's not a pretty subject. I mean, cancer is not pretty, um, you know. But we talk about that more easily than we talk about mental illness. Okay. So it just kind of it kind of came to me. I, I had to tell the story, and I did. And you know, I 
have never left, you know, doing what I'm doing. So your advice is for people to find their purpose as they go through life. It'll come to them. Or let it, yeah, or let it find you. I mean, I'm, this may not be, you know, I may not, this may not be the only purpose I have, but, uh, you know, a couple other things have come to me in the last couple of years and, you know, I'll pursue those. I mean, but I mean, for example, I mean, when I tell my story about, you know, and it's not, it's a very crazy story, but when I tell my story, I realize that actually, I never knew this. I actually had a knack for telling stories. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'd love to be able one day to tell stories that have nothing to do with mental illness, Mm -hmm. but I'm not there yet. Gotcha. I'm not there yet. Well, Andy, I appreciate you coming on this show and sharing with what, sharing with our listeners, what you know about bipolar. Hopefully our listeners will reach out to you if they have any questions. Like I said, all the information will be in our show notes, Andy. And when you get that movie launched, I hope you come back on the show and talk about it with us. Maybe I'll come to you first. Should I make that promise? I yes. like it. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much, Jay. You bet. Thanks, Andy. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of The Conquer Worry Show. For additional resources and tips on conquering worry, please visit our website at conquerworry.org.